Hey, Father, we thank you for this time together, Lord. We thank you for your word that enriches us and changes us and challenges us, Lord. We thank you that it's your desire that we prosper and be in health even as our souls prosper. So we thank you that you're a good, good Father, and you're going to speak to us today. I want you all to say, Heavenly Father, speak to my heart, change my life, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we've been doing a series uh, starting, uh, that started in September called Mending the Nets. Uh, the first week, we talked about um, mending and casting nets. We talked about the importance of um, uh, casting our ministry that we do for the Lord, we have different ministries here at the church, and those represent nets. And we cast the nets out to catch the fish, because Jesus said to his disciples, you need to be fishers of men. Amen? But we talked about the importance of realizing that sometimes we get holes in the net. And there's seasons in our lives that we have to mend the nets so that when we cast them, the fish stay in the nets. Does that make sense? And so there's seasons in the, in the church life and in Christian life where you have to pull back and you have to mend your relationship with the Lord and with one another and make sure your relationship is mended strong so that your life will catch others and bring them into the kingdom. We talked about that the first week. The second week, we talked about four different chairs at our table. We talked about the table, dinner table, which represents our church, and then the meal on the table represents the word that we preach or that we deliver. Does anyone remember the four chairs, the four different types of people that sit at the table? Let me see a hand. What's the first person? The curious. So we have some people that are coming to church, they're curious. Maybe they never heard the gospel before, or maybe they're just curious to see what we're teaching at the church. They're coming in, they're curious. What's the next, what's the next group of people? Does anyone remember? Connected. connected. And those are people that have connected to Christ. They've become a member of the body of Christ. They're connected to Jesus, but they're not yet the next stage, which is committed. So then you become committed. You commit to the vision of the church and the ministry. You begin to commit your gift that God has given you to the overall process of building the house of God. Amen. And then the next group is the catalyst. You guys are good. You guys are listening to my preaching. This is good. I didn't even remember. No, just kidding. Uh, but the catalysts are those who are believing God for are, are the ones that say, you know what? We're going to believe God for a move of God. We're going to take the city. We're going to see lives change. And they're the people that are just like gung-ho for Jesus. I'm going to hear what I'm saying. And so we have all four groups of people. We talked about how we need one another to grow and to develop and move through the stages of growth as a Christian. And so that was week number two. Week number three, Pastor Peter spoke about stepping out of the boat. He talked about how it's, it's okay to try and fail. How many know it's okay to fail? At least you're trying. But it's not okay to fail to try. That was pretty much that message. It was a great message. But this week I want to talk about, the title of my message is Remember to Return. Remember to Return. And this is something that God dropped in my heart just the last couple of days and even for my own life that I would remember to return. And I want to start this, this week here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, some things have become new. Is that what it says? No, it says all things have become new. There's been something that happened on the inside. The moment you receive Christ, there's a transformation that takes place. All of a sudden now you're living on a different plane. There's, there's, there's something that has to shift inside of us when we get born again. And the, the amazing thing is we have to understand that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's funny, uh, it, it's not said that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and yourself. It doesn't say that. Because when you get born again, what happens is you become a new creation, something that's never been created before. What is that? That God's spirit comes and becomes one spirit with your spirit and intertwines with you and you become one in Christ and your spirit and his spirit merge together and you become a new creation. So you're, you cannot be separated. You become, just like as when you get married, you become one flesh. You become one spirit with the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? That's why no demon in hell, no, nothing can separate you from his love. Why? Because there, there's been a blend. How, how many know if you make a milkshake and you put the ice cream in and then you put in the, the strawberry mix and you put in a little bit of this, a little bit, and you blend that thing up, guess what? You can't separate it. Amen? And so we are one with Christ. Say, I'm one with Christ. All right? And so, so something's taken place here. 
And it really comes down to this word called metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. And we get that. We understand the butterfly comes from a caterpillar. And a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. We understand that whole process. And we need to understand if we've been born again, you now are going to live on a different plane. Okay? Your diet changes. Right? Just like the caterpillar would eat leaves, a butterfly now eats nectar. Right? There's, a di- there's, a, there's, a, there's nourishment coming from a different source. How many hear what I'm saying? Your diet changes. Say, my diet changes. And I remember I used to receive my nourishment before I was a believer from other people's state of depression. You know, I'd listen to some of my music, my rock music, and it's all about, you know, how depressed and Susie left me and I'm drinking at the bar and I'm thinking, I don't feel so bad now, you know. I feel nourished because I'm not as bad off as that guy. I can relate to that. I feel my life's okay. How many hear what I'm saying? And, and so you, and, and I'd hang out with people who, who were just trying to get by, just crawling by, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm not so bad. And I found nourishment and strength from talking to the depressed. Amen? And, and that's kind of where we are. But when we get born again, something changed in me, and that is that I, I now draw my nourishment from the Bible. I draw my nourishment from God's Word. I draw my nourishment from times of prayer. And we begin to draw from a different source. It's like a nectar, it's, it, and it brings you into a place of life and freedom. And so you see from a new perspective. You begin to see life from heaven's perspective, just like the butterfly, you know. You ever wonder if a butterfly can even think enough to think this? Flying over a stone and saying, yeah, I remember when I was a caterpillar. I never saw it from this perspective. It was one-dimensional. Now I can see things and understand things I didn't understand before because they're seeing things from heaven's perspective. And when you get born again, you'll begin, your eyes will begin to open. You'll begin to see things that other people say, hey, you're crazy. What are you talking? I don't see that. But you'll see things from God's perspective because you're in a different plane because you've been born again. And this is so important. I'll give you an example of that. You begin to understand that our fight is not with flesh and blood. We understand that that the enemy is whispering in people's ears and they're behaving in certain ways that are offensive to us. And then Jesus tells us, because we understand that it's, it's, it's a spiritual war, then I want you to do something really strange. I want you to love your enemies. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. And so you start talking to your friends who haven't had a Christ encounter yet, and you're saying, you know, I'm praying for my enemy. And they're like, what, are you nuts? Man, it's, it's an eye for an eye, man. If they've, if they've hurt you, you, you mean, why would you be nice to them? Why would you pray for them? That doesn't make any sense. They begin to look at some of the things you're doing, and you're praying for people that are hurting you, and you're giving 10% of your income to to God's house? Like, what's that all about? Like, that's crazy. And they begin to look at some of the things you do, and they don't seem normal. Why? Because they're crawling on the ground. They've not had the heaven's perspective yet, and they don't see things the way God sees things. Am I preaching okay today? Are you getting this? And so you're a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so we're in a different plane. Okay? And I want to say this to, to you. If you've said a prayer and you've not had this experience of, of the new perspective, um, then we're going to have a, a prayer time at the end. And I'm going to invite you up. We're going to have our prayer team pray with you so that you walk away saying, ah, I see things differently. And you know what? Just because we see things differently and we're in a different realm doesn't mean we don't have problems, doesn't mean we don't once in a while sin or make a mistake, amen? But it's just that we're seeing things differently. And I know so many people come to church, they get saved, and then they struggle. They might come to church once a month and struggle, and their life doesn't change, and they still don't see things from this new perspective. And I'm saying we want to see you get the breakthrough. And so if you've said a prayer and haven't seen that change, we're going to pray with you today. We're going to see that come to pass, amen? We want you to have this experience of the new birth. And so, we'll pray for you. Is that okay? Awesome. So what I want to do today is I just want to share uh, an analogy to just kind of help us understand uh, the kingdom of God and what takes place when we get born again. Uh, this, this analogy I'm using, it's an allegory, it um, was, uh, was actually from Plato in 346, he, in 346 B.C., 
uh, to, I think he died in 446. He was a Greek philosopher, and I'm just going to steal it because it ties in so good uh, to Christianity, and we can learn from it. Now, what Plato was doing was he was talking about the effects of education and the lack of education on our nature. And so I'm going to take that from an education and bring it into a spiritual realm. Is that okay? And so we're going to start here. I want you to imagine. We'll go to the next slide. Okay. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Do I not have a slide with a picture in there? Next one. Okay, here we go. So I want to I look at this analogy here that, he, that Plato came up with. I want you to imagine, okay? You can see these people here are behind the stone wall. And these people here, you're one of these people. And I want you to imagine from the time that you came to consciousness, the time that you were born, you were chained to a wall. Your neck was chained, your arms were chained, your feet were chained, and you could not move. You couldn't even look at the people beside you. All you know is the wall that's in front of you. And you're facing this wall, and there's a flickering light on the wall. And behind you, there's the, 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 this wall that you see, and there's these crazy satanic-looking dudes here in the picture. But they're carrying these objects above the wall. And because the wall is hiding them, you can't see them, but you see the objects and behind them, there's a fire that's, that's creating the flickering on the wall in front of you. And I want to imagine that you're, you're sitting there. Just imagine that that's all you know is the wall in front of you. And you see this flickering light and you see these shadows moving. And all you do is you look to the person next to you. You can't really look, but you're talking to the person next to you. And you say, hey, man, look at this, this shadow, this thing here. This, this, is a, this looks like a, it, it, we'll call it a horse. And here, here's an eagle, and we'll call this thing a vase. And you sit down and you discuss, and you're talking about the, these things in front of you as if that's what they actually are. And you're trying to discuss it. And you say, you know, I think, I think sex is the answer. I just need to have a better sex life. I, I, think, I think money is the answer. I think, I think that uh, if I could get more money, if I could get a better education, um, uh, you know, I, I think partying, I think whatever. This is life to me. This is what life is all about. And so you're staring at the shadows on the wall. All right? And that's all you know. You don't know anything else. And then Isaiah 9, 2 says in, in, in references, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, who have dwelt in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them a light has shined. The next verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, says that Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. And they are unable to see the glorious light of God's good news. Why? They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact, say the exact, likeness of God. And so, so what happens is um, you're, sh you're shackled to this cave. And you can't move. And you're, you're, the only reality you know is the shadows that pass before you. And you're talking with your buddies. and Hey, this, I think this is that. And I think this is what life's about. And you're looking at the shadows on the wall. And let's say by some chance, those shackles, just imagine you're laying there. All of a sudden, your shackles pop open. Just yours. And you realize, hey, I can move again. And you begin to stand up, and, and, and as you stand up, you, you, you hear a voice saying, look behind you. And you turn around slowly, and you scream, and you hold your eyes. Oh, the light. And you cover your eyes because you've never seen a fire before. All you've seen is the, 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 the effects of the fire on the wall in front of you. You turn around, your eyes are burning, and you hold your eyes, and you start looking around, and as your eyes begin to adjust a little bit to the light, you, you look, and all of a sudden you realize, hold on a second, that thing that I call a horse actually looks different. Oh, oh, hold on, that's actually a reflection on the wall of the actual, ob oh, that's just a reflection. That's not the truth. The truth is here. This is what it really is. And you begin to see all these objects, and you begin to to, to say, hey, life is different than what I thought. I thought life was about the shadows on the wall. And all of a sudden, you're realizing that life is different. There's a different perspective. And you don't know what's happened. 
And I want to say this is what the call of God is actually in Isaiah 52, verse 2. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourselves from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. There's a time God now in this time is beginning to loose the shackles so that people can come free and realize that life is bigger than what they thought it was. Amen? So the shackles open and the prisoner is freed. Plato doesn't tell us how, but we know how, right? And I believe that there's, there's, there's moments, I call them kairos moments, where God just shows up and the shackles open. And you can make a decision, am I going to stand up or I'm going to sit in the dust and stare at the shadows? And I believe that God is calling us as a church to realize that we're living in a day now where people, God is snapping shackles open all over the place. And people, are, people need to realize that if they stand up and turn around, life is different. Amen. Because the God of this world, Satan has blinded those who do not believe they can't see the glorious light. You guys know what I'm talking about. How many of you have got born again and now you look back and say, hey, I, I can see things differently now. I can see that I was looking at shadows and that I'm in a new place today. Amen. How many can relate to that? All right. And so this is where we're at. And there's Kairos moments, times when God himself comes and says, this is a moment I'm going to deliver my people. In Acts chapter 12, verse 6 to 7, it says, On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, this being Peter, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in his cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And there's moments where God comes and he says, Get up quickly, and those chains open, and we need to respond to the grace of God. Amen? In John chapter 8, verse 36, says, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so here you are now. You're free. And you look around. You see the fire. You're you're starting to figure out the, hey, listen, I was living in a reality that wasn't reality. And as you're looking and you're, you're contemplating, you're, you are contemplating, should I sit down? Because this is new and this is freaking me out. And I don't know what to think of all this. All of a sudden, as you're trying to contemplate what you're going to do next, you're considering sitting back down and staring at the shadows because all your buddies are saying, hey, what are you doing? Where do you, where'd you go? Come sit down. All of a sudden, someone grabs you from behind and drags you all the way up to the top of the cave and thrust you out into the sunlight and hold you there and as you scream into, ah, my eyes, because you've never seen the sun. And you cover yourself and you fall on the grass and you're like, oh, my goodness. Ah. And you're laying there for hours. But as, as you start to adjust, it's very painful for your eyes. But as you begin to adjust, you open your eyes and you see this green stuff that you're laying in. You're like, wow, what is this? This is cool. And you grab it and you put it in your mouth and you start to chew it. And you spit it out. It's bitter. It's, that kind of reminds me of the cockroaches I always eat. Well, you're in a cave. What else do you eat, right? It's bitter. But you get up and you begin to wander around and you can feel the grass in your toes. And you can, you, you, you can see the, the, the water and you see your reflection of the water. And there's this brown thing with all of these green th- shaggy stuff on it and you're like what is this right and you sit down and you look up and there's this red thing hanging in front of your face and you pull it off and you take a bite and it's a macintosh how many like macintosh i like macintosh and it's sweet to the taste and you're experiencing this life and all of a sudden in 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 the ecstasy of this awesome glory that you found, you have a thought. And you remember your friends back in the cave. And you're sitting there going, oh, man, if only my friends knew that this world existed. Uh, I got to go and tell my friends. I got to go and tell my friends. And that's why this message is called Remember to Return. Because many times we get out of the cave and we get comfortable And we begin to see things we never saw before. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17 says, 
Christ is the invisible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Through him, God created everything in heaven, on earth. He made everything we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Say, everything was created through him and for him. And this is a revelation that you get when you get out of those shackles. And someone drags you out of the cave. What is that dragging process called? It's called discipleship. And we're called the disciple. I'm going to drag you by the hair if I have to, but I'm pulling you because you've got to see this thing that it might take a while to look directly at. It's called the sun, not the S-U-N. It's the S-O-N. It's the son of God, and everything was created for him and by him. He made your girlfriend. He made, your, you know, he made the tree in your front lawn. I mean, he made everything, and he's the God of all things. And, and, and you begin to realize that Jesus is God, and it transforms your life. And you have that revelation. But you remember, hey, my friends are in the cave. So step number one, we'll bring up the next slide. Step number one, there's four steps to take. Remember where you came from. Just one at a time, Brian. Remember where you came from. And that's the hardest thing to do. you got to remember, hey, listen, I came from this place. And you need to spend some time in the presence of God. You need to get to know the things of God. But you need to go back and remember where you came from. And you begin to go back to that place. Okay? Remember where you came from. You start heading back to the cave, and you return to your cave. Next step. Okay? But when you return, what happens is um, your eyes have become accustomed to the light. And so now, just as it was uncomfortable for your eyes and uncomfortable for you to come into the light, now it's really uncomfortable for you to go back into the darkness. And I don't know about you, but there's times where I just like, Lord, I just want to go to church. I just want to be around Christians. I just want to worship God. Because when I get around these people or I go back, and it's uncomfortable for me. It's darkness. And it's like I, I have, I've had this experience with God, and now I'm going back in, and they're just going to ridicule me and make fun of me because they don't understand how many know what I'm talking about. And so there's this uncomfortableness about going into the darkness darkness to rescue people and that's why majority of the church I think it's less than eight percent evangelize because there's this uncomfortableness it's not because we don't love Jesus it's not because we don't care it's not because you know we're even afraid sometimes it's the uncomfortable feeling of going into dark places I don't want to go back there I've been set free and so you go back to the cave because you want to obey Jesus You love God and you care about these people. So you go back to the cave and uh, your eyes need to adjust again to the darkness. You're going in. And how many know, you know, when when, uh, you're in the light and someone flicks the lights off and uh, and all of a sudden you see like all these stars and everything, right? And that's what happens. You go back into this place. It's uncomfortable. And so you return to your cave. And when you return to the prisoners, you tell them of your truth. That's the next step. You release your story. And when you release your story, that's when the shackles can open. That's when you give your testimony. Amen? You release your testimony, and they laugh, and they ridicule sometimes. And they'll say stuff like, what are you talking about, man? Why don't you just sit down and sit, sit at the wall here? Why did you take your shackles off, man? Let's, let's look at the shadows. Let's talk about what's going on here. Like, this is life, man. And you're like, no, no, I, I have to explain something to you. What you think is life, you know, you're looking at this and you're thinking, you know, this, this is reality. But really, behind you, th- there's actually these people that are carrying objects. And, and these objects are th- th- three-dimensional objects. And, and, and they, they have actual colors. You know what color is? I don't know what color is. And, and you're trying to explain to them the world that you've experienced, but they don't understand. How many have been there? And so they ridicule and they laugh. And they say, get down, let's talk about life. You're crazy. And what's really going on, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us exactly what's going on. We're going to look at that in the scripture. In John chapter 3, verse 17 to 20, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world. And people feel judged. How can they're, they're in darkness. They don't know any better. And they feel judged when you approach them. There is no judgment 
against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's only son. So we need people to understand our testimony is about the son. It's not about their sins. It's about the son. And the judgment is based on this fact that God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All those who do evil hate the light, and here's the key, they refuse to go near the light for fear that their sins will be exposed. And I love the Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul, he used to say stuff like, hey, listen, I'm the chief of sinners. The Bible says God is not holding your sins against you anymore. He took them. All you need to do is receive him, repent, and come into the kingdom of God. And by the way, I'm the chief of sinners. I've made my mistakes. I used to persecute Christians. And I am not better than you. I'm just better off because I've received his grace. It's so important when we're going to people who are shackled to remind them, listen, we're the chiefs of sinners as well. And we were delivered because God opened our shackles. And so when you have that story, people will hear because already the accuser of the brethren is coming to make them feel like they're not worthy. And the truth is they're not. But they're afraid. And because they're afraid, they don't come to the light because they don't want their deeds to be exposed. And so what you have to do is tell people, listen, life is better on the other side. There's a sun up there. It's awesome. Good tune. And... Um, so God, God wants us to go back into the place. Say, I need to remember to return and to release my story. And that's all God's asking us to do. To go, return, release our story, all right, to those who are still shackled in the cave. And I want to say this. Some Christians do retreat back into their old reality. And I've seen this, especially with younger Christians that go in and they have a heart to win people. And they come in and they, they hang out at the, at the wall and they're saying, guys, you know, you got to get saved and you need to. And they're saying, no, come sit down with us. You're stupid. This is crazy. What about all this God stuff? Sit down and look at the shadows. And, 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 and then all of a sudden they, they, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. And they sit down and they put their shackles back on and they go back into that reality. In Mark chapter 4, 17, it says, um, but since these people don't have any deep roots in themselves, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Don't let anybody persecute you and pull you from the experience of God's glory into a cave to stare at a wall. We all have a story. How many have a story? Let me see your hand. That's your story. We're not going to do that. We're going to be a people that go down... And we're going to actually open people's shackles. And I'm going to tell you how to open their shackles. The gospel opens the shackles. The Bible says, Paul says, the, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Amen. And so when we go out and we share the good news, the gospel of Jesus, those shackles open so people can return back to God. Amen. And that's what God is calling us to do. The Bible actually says that we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and the the word of our testimony. So how do we overcome? We overcome him in our lives with the applied blood of Jesus. We deal with our sins. And so the, the enemy's power is broken in our lives. And then we go to others and we give them our story, our testimony. And then they go, oh man, if God could do it for you, maybe he could do it for me. And all it takes is one little seed of faith to say, maybe this is real. The shackles pop open and they're able to be free. They just need to stand up. So we need to tell our story. And, and, and the enemy would come to say to you, you don't know the Bible well enough. Or you don't have all the answers. But the reality is none of us do. All we know is that once we were blind and now we see. All we know is we put our faith in Jesus and we followed our heart. And now we see glory. Now we see God. Now we see life from a different perspective. Amen? So step number four is remember to return then to release and here's the important one, number four, is return back to your new life or retreat back. And I, I don't mean retreat. I think we need to visit the cave as much as possible, but you can't live in the cave because how many know we need to be in the presence of God all the time? Amen? 
And so we come into the cave and we share our story and we tell people, listen, God has a plan for you. And I see things from you. You got to come with me. This is awesome. I'm not interested. Okay, well, listen, I'll be praying for you. I'm going back out in the sunlight. How many hear what I'm saying? And I've seen Christians going and they just stay in the cave, man, and they just hang out. And, they, and next thing you know, they stop coming to church and they stop serving God. And it's what, they had a great heart, but they forgot what it was like to be in heaven's perspective. Amen? Um, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and this talks about those people. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world. Don't look at the shadows on the wall and sit around and talk about it. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and precious and perfect. And how do we do that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. See the word plead? Come back to God. Why in the world do we plead with people? Why? Because they're in darkness and we have to, we have, you got to come check this out. You got to experience this. You know, I was just at a conference last week and there was a preacher, Brett Cantillon, right? Brent? I think it was Brent. Anyway, he was just telling a story of a guy who got saved and he was working out of the gym. He was a big guy and he went to the gym and he's working out and this, this guy comes in and stands in front of him and says, I, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you the gospel. I want to tell you about my story. And the guy's like, I'm not interested. I'm lifting weights. And so he waited till the guy was pumping weights and he was, you know, and he came up and said, I- I'm not leaving till you hear my story. I got to, you got to hear the story about Jesus. The guy's like, I'm not interested. He put the barbell down and he tried to push his way through. And this little guy stood in the doorway and said, I'm not leaving you alone till you listen to my story. And the guy, the guy's like, what am I going to do with this guy? He said, well, in fact, he goes, all I want you to do, uh, you know, what it was, he says, I want you to pray this prayer with me, and then I'll leave you alone. And the guy's like, no, I, I don't want to do it. He goes, I'm not leaving, and he put a big stink up. And I'm not saying you need to do this, but this is what this guy did. So finally, the guy's like, fine, I'll say the prayer. What's the prayer? And the, 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 the other guy said, Heavenly Father, and he's like, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, thank you for sending Jesus, to live in my heart, to live in my heart. And then he stopped, and he thought to himself, that would be a really good idea if God lived in my heart. Something, one little sentence in the prayer, and he, something shifted in him. He's like, yeah. And then he, then he started meaning the prayer, and he finished the prayer, and God took up residence in him. And something shifted because someone was willing to plead, and someone was willing to push, and someone was willing to say, this is so real to me that I'm just going to push it till you get it. Amen? And again, I'm not saying go and bully people, but I'm just saying, for this case, it worked. And we have to be a people who understand the importance of sharing the gospel. So we return, we release, we retreat back, okay? Um, Very interesting, uh, a few years back, probably about maybe 10 years ago, I met with, we were doing a meeting in Kingston at, at a small church, and this husband and wife came up, and they wanted prayer for their daughter who was backslidden. So I don't remember if you prayed with me, if you were there, honey, but I know I was there, and I prayed with this husband and wife for their daughter who was backslidden, and we prayed, and we, and we, we prayed, and I, at the end, I said, what's your daughter's name? And she, they said, Her daughter, our daughter's name is Avril, Avril Levine. And, and we, I prayed with them, and just this week, I saw her new, her new song that, I don't know if you guys seen it, it's like a worship song talking about putting herself at the altar and giving her and crying out to God. And so I know her mother, she went through five years of illness. Um, and I don't know where she's at at her journey, but I'll tell you this, the shackles have come off and she's seeing the light. And her mother was praying with her at, at her bed and, and, and God, is, God is doing something. And I, I believe there was others that prayed, but my heart jumped inside because you know why? Because we overcome him by the blood of the lamb. We apply the blood. We pray and we pray. We pray for those who don't know him. And then we give our story and God does the rest. Amen. 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 You know what? The uh, last verse I want to share here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 talks about our responsibility. 
And uh, I don't have that on the PowerPoint. It's okay. It's, it's Paul saying, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Amen? And so many times, a lot of people, we, what happens is we don't evangelize because we feel like we've been let down. Listen, I went and witnessed to a guy once on the street, and he spit in my face. I've had stuff like that happen. Some of, some of you, actually, I had a young guy when I was doing evangelism in St. Catharines. I had a young guy, and he was cool, and he was like, you know, he, ah, this is so uncool to go talk to me, but I'm going to do it because I love Jesus. So we went out on the street, and I said, no, it'll be fine. I, nothing bad will happen. They'll just take your track. And he's like, okay. So he put his rollerblades on. He comes in. comes up to the first person he gives a track to, and the guy punches him in the face. <laughs> and he's like, you told me. I'm sorry, man. Anyway, bad experience. Um, that doesn't always happen. But w- what we fail to realize, right, is that we don't bring the increase. God does. And your story might just be a seed that somebody needs. And then six months down the road, God will send somebody else. And four months later, God will send somebody else. And over a period of time, that person moves from a negative 10 belief to a negative 8 to a negative 6, a negative 4. Zero is where they get saved. And then they go into discipleship. People start dragging them out of the cave. They're like, where am I going? Right? And there's that process. And you're just, you and I, so you and I are part of the process. And our responsibility is to share our story. Because Jesus said, you know, he said to his disciples, he said, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit, right? Not many days from, the, from now. And you will receive power to what? To be witnesses. And all a witness does in a court of law is this is what I've seen, this is what I've heard. The decision, the judge, and the jury, they make this. You just share what you've seen and what you've heard. So I wanted to encourage you with this message today that... Um, we would remember to return and prayerfully just say, God, help me to, to remember from where I came from, the darkness. Sometimes it's good to sit alone and think about the darkness that we came from, you know. I had a, this woman that I was, uh, my friend Derek's mother, she, she, she was really depressed one day. I came up and said, what happened to you, right? She goes, well, I prayed a really stupid prayer. I said, what was that? She said, well, she said, I, I, I said, you know, I wanted a heart for the lost. So I said, Lord, would you... Remind me what it felt like not to be saved. And she goes, I've just been like, this is awful. She's like, I feel like, like God's nowhere, right? And I was just like, because you forget. You forget where you came from. Amen? And she experienced that for a few days, and it came back, and then she went out and evangelized. So that, this is what I'm saying. It's, we need to remember and return to the place we were to reach others. Amen? Amen. In just a few minutes, I'm going to pray. If I could have uh, Bianca come to the keys. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand? Can you say this with me? Say, people plant, people water, but God brings the increase. There's no pressure, amen? Do you want to share something? I just wanted to em- emphasize the, or clarify the thing is the story that Travis shared was it's the power of the gospel, you know, and I, I think, even though I know Travis said this too, but sometimes we get caught up on what we can bring or what we can't bring, but they were talking the reason they shared this story about this persuasive guy was the point was the power of the gospel. So, you know, this person was trying all these ways and this guy was just getting more and more flustered, more and more frustrated and like, no, I don't want to hear the gospel. I don't want to hear this stuff that you have. But because he knew the power of the gospel, he didn't give up. He wasn't focusing on what he had to offer, what he didn't have to offer other than the power of the gospel. So then as he was sharing or praying or whatever, all of a sudden the power worked in him. So the, the point of that story was the power of the gospel. So you might look at you and say, well, I don't dare to do that, or I don't have that, or maybe I am like this. But if you dare to just ask God to be created with the power of the gospel, then so we take our eyes off of us. We're just obedient, like Travis said. We share. You, it's not your responsibility to make them saved. It's just your responsibility to be a testimony, to share. But we can't lose faith in the power of the gospel. That was the point of that story. That's good. Amen. And, and, and just before we pray, I want to share this testimony. How many remember the message I preached beginning of the summer, and I talked about how God was going to do a new thing in September, and he was going to move in the, in the marketplace, and he was going to move in the schools? Do you, do you remember that? And I said, the Lord had shown me that 30 years ago. 
to, it actually was to the month that 30 years ago they took prayer out of the school and when they did the presence of God lifted but that after 30 years which would be September the presence of God would begin to descend again amen I remember I shared that so we've had a couple experiences already. We had someone from our church down at uh, the Trenton School there witnessing, had a crowd of kids. Twelve kids got born again and gave their hearts to Jesus. So we, we want to know. It's, we're living in a time where the shackles are open and people are wandering around the cave going, what next? And the church is hanging out in the sunlight. We need to get down there and we have to rescue people. Now, So Father, right now I just pray, God, that uh, every person in this place that you're speaking to their heart this morning and you're you're pulling on their heartstrings, God, that they would respond today to that call in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can we just sing that song? And if that's you in this place and God's speaking to your heart, just come forward. We're going to have our prayer team. Prayer team, as people are coming forward, I want you to come. We're going to pray with you. We're going to intercede with you.